Hello there. Looks like the over 50s could be staying in lockdown. And if you want to jet around the world post lockdown, think again. Firstly, please give this video a like to give my channel a boost and I'm always uploading new videos, so please do check back daily. And a happy birthday to that NHS fundraising juggernaut, Tom Moore, who was promoted from captain to colonel on this, his 100th birthday. So what's this I hear about recommendations that the over 50s stay in lockdown, after the younger generation have all returned to a near normal life? Well, this is based on research by two professors from Warwick University that looks at the invisible enemy and its effect across the age ranges. The research called Age, Death Risk and the Design of an Exit Strategy, a Guide for Policymakers and for Citizens Who Want to Stay Alive, looked at the data from three countries significantly affected by the virus and they said that the numbers convey the stark facts. In any general release from lockdown, it is probable that fatalities among 50-year-olds would be 20 times more than among 20-year-olds, and that among 60-year-olds, the fatalities would be approximately 50 times as great as among those in their early 20s. And it goes on to say that, therefore, any lockdown release policy that does not design itself around what the authors call the extreme age gradient risk that the invisible enemy presents is likely to have dangerous consequences for citizens. And when you look at the data for March 2020 on this from the Office for National Statistics, you get the idea. I've plotted out this graph from the March 2020 ONS data, and you can see for yourself in which age brackets the fatalities from the invisible enemy occur in England and Wales. And the ramping up seems to start somewhere between 45 and 50 years of age. And it presumably only tails off above 80 to 85 because there are far fewer people at that age anyway. Although it's not so apparent on this graph, the number of male fatalities makes up 61% of the total. Wonder if there'll be a huge report on this aspect and calls for all males involved in healthcare to be removed from treating victims of the invisible enemy. If you get my drift from other newspaper reports. And as an aside, the numbers for Wales appear to be proportionally less than for England by quite a margin. But four out of every five deaths amongst the over 70s is reported to have had a connection to the invisible enemy. Now there are questions over this data. Is it death with or death of the disease? But that's for another day. Because the research by Professors Oswald and Portharvey covers China, Italy and the UK. A much wider data set than just the ONS data for England and Wales, obviously. And the authors say that... The useful thing to be learned from the three figures is the shape of the relationship that links risk to age. It slopes powerfully upwards and does so in an accelerating way. And another interesting thing here is that the Telegraph quotes Professor Oswald talking about these age-related mortality differences in another report, saying... The simplest and extremely influential factor to bear in mind is your age. There's these astonishing age gradients, which are huge and very unusual in epidemiology. It's common to see a risk factor that, for example, doubles your chance of disease or illness, but it's extremely rare to see something that raises it 50-fold. And he goes on to say that the problem comes in at around the age of 50. I suddenly have visions of the over 50s being forcibly isolated and herded into hurriedly built Nissan Hut style care homes to be fed on a wartime diet of spam, boiled cabbage and BBC output. <sighs> 
Now, the authors of the report are recommending an age-staged return to normality to minimise the risks. But this, of course, will take time. And as the young start to mix together again, they could catch it and pass it on to their elderly relatives and friends. We could end up with a very young workforce supporting the whole country while it searches for a cure, while being totally isolated from the older ones. And here's how it could be enforced. According to the report, how would an age-based release rule be enforced? Presumably, police officers would have to be given the right to find those caught breaking the age rule. As we have explained elsewhere, the vast majority of citizens in the UK carry driving licences that would allow a police officer to check their date of birth. Most nations have something similar. Now I've got a better 1984 style solution. How about issuing a one year only travel pass to everyone aged 49 or under, as long as they can prove they have a need to travel, of course. Now I'm not sure that's what any of us want, apart from the spreadsheet control freaks, of course. Moving on. Many people are probably right now dreaming about booking that post-lockdown holiday to Ibiza and the like. But you might well be disappointed. And why? Because the airline industry is in a total mess and there are concerns that airport procedures would have to be so tight that very lengthy waiting times would be involved. Not only that, but there will be a reduced number of flights for quite a while where seating will be limited by social distancing rules. All this will make air travel very expensive and probably very exclusive too. The Daily Mail reports that once the lockdown ends, it could take up to four hours to simply board a plane. And the report says, Flyers could be asked to arrive at airports four hours in advance to allow for health checks and social distancing measures, one expert warns. Flights will be more expensive because airlines will only be allowed to have a limited number of people on board to ensure they stay two metres apart. And the report goes on to say that these procedures and costs could stay in place for up to five years. And it quotes the managing director of aviation advocacy, Andrew Charlton, saying, Even if it starts raining vaccines tonight, we are still looking at two years at least to get back to levels seen before the outbreak, and it is probably going to be more like five years. And he says that there will be very uncomfortable conditions because of the demands to wear personal protective equipment and maintain social distancing. Then, of course, there's the 14-day quarantine before you're allowed home when you get back from your travels. And what if the country you travel to insists on you quarantining prior to being allowed out to take those embarrassing selfies to bore your friends and relations with when you return from your holes? Now let's give this a little bit of thought, shall we? This means that only the wealthier or most committed people will be travelling. So what about politicians, CEOs and executives of global companies? The lovies that have to travel the world, acting, singing and telling us all to stay at home and save everything. Many of these will either have state money or personal wealth behind them. How long before there's a specially vetted flying club class that allows them to breeze in and out of countries and airports at a whim? As long as they've been tested in the last few days. Because you can bet your shirt on them getting around any of this pesky get-treated-like-a-prole stuff. Now, changing tack, the European Union and our pro-rejoin-the-EU brigade keep saying that neither the UK nor the EU have the political bandwidth to complete these trade talks whilst the invisible enemy stalks the land, don't they? So they keep squealing for a Brexit implementation period extension in the vain hope that somehow Brexit can be reversed. What they forget to tell you, though, is that according to the EU Commission, Two days ago, the EU and Mexico managed to conclude 
the last outstanding element of the negotiation of their new trade agreement. Trade Commissioner Phil Hogan and Mexican Minister of Economy Graciela Marquez Collin, in a phone call today, agreed on the exact scope of the reciprocal opening of public procurement markets and a high level of predictability and transparency in public procurement processes. With this, the EU and Mexico can advance to the signature and ratification of this agreement in line with their respective rules and procedures. Isn't the telephone a wonderful device? And the EU Commissioner for Trade, Phil Hogan, said that while most of their efforts had been focused on the public health crisis, we have also been working to advance our open and fair trade agenda, which continues to be very important. So now that's done, more bandwidth for Brexit then. But the EU Commission also reports that it has started infringement proceedings against Poland. This is over a new law that came into effect in Poland on the 14th of February that Brussels claims undermines the judicial independence of Polish judges and is incompatible with the primacy of EU law. Seems to be plenty of bandwidth floating about out there, doesn't there? Anyway, if you want to hear more from me, please don't forget to subscribe and also press that little bell, or you won't get any notifications. And if you want to see more of me, buy a mug with my mug on it. So, what do you think about all of this? Please share and comment, and thank you for watching.